until just now, there was a few people who used Docker before. Right? Oh. Okay. So this is just a very rather short introduction. Uh, just to get to know a little bit about Docker and how it's used, why it's used and so on. Uh, just a little bit about me. So I'm Chris Heng. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Pi. So we make uh, chat apps for business. Yeah. And it's kind of featured the app stores of this. Try it out. Okay, so what's Docker? Yeah, so you see the popular well logo there. <coughs> and you see a lot of these words here. These are Concepts, these are tools, these uh, underlying libraries in Linux that have been around for quite a while. Uh, it's just recently that people have created a uh, user friendly interface over there. So, what Docker does is bring all these concepts together and gives it, uh, some, and gives it a layer mm. that makes it easy to use. And yeah, since I'm mostly a back end front end developer, so some of you who are Actually, more familiar with me that should know more about this than me. It's an expression layer for Linux containers, and there's, there's no such thing as a well, container, isn't It's actually a co collection of different concepts in Linux. And so, what Docker does is bring this together. It's written in Google Go, GoLang, and it started as an internal project in Top Cloud, which is a platform company. and. They open source it in March 2013, so now it's the second birthday. And since it was so successful, they have pivoted and just concentrate solely on Docker. They become Docker Inc. Then they started releasing uh, more tools around it um, and contributed to the ecosystem. And why do we use Docker? Well, the primary use case is for lightweight containers. So it uses less resources compared to a virtual machine. So, so it basically is like a virtual machine. You have uh, OS inside it and then you run the process inside it. So the process doesn't see anything on the host machine. It basically assumes that it's inside another OS. And what you can do with it is create repeatable consistent builds as long as you declare the build process carefully. Dependency, dependency isolation. So since each process is within Docker runs in its own environment, so that means you can have things like maybe PHP, one version of PHP for one process, another version of PHP for another, and they run the same machine without conflicting. And this results in a pristine host OS. Only Docker needs to be installed. Then as long as you run everything inside a Docker container, then you don't need to install anything else on the host OS. So some use cases, for example, if you want to upgrade PHP for application, so you want to use like PHP 7 or something, but you have an old vBlend installation that is PHP 5.3, then you can just keep it in a container. Then your new app can run in PHP 7 without problems. Or you want to run something uh, something like PHP 2.7, uh, Python 2.7 and Python 3 together. Or you want to just switch the OS entirely. For example, you don't want to use Ubuntu, you want to switch to Debian or something else. You can also do that. And you can also get the same image. So Docker runs on images and you want to run that image on your laptop, your CI service, your staging server, your production server, you are having to pick different kinds of images. For example, your, your production service on Amazon AWS. So to get that image onto AWS, you have to turn it into an AMI, a machine image. But here you don't need to, you can keep everything the same image. So it makes it relatively painless to do, to do all this. <coughs> so most of you will be more familiar with Vagrant. Since a lot of people, when they develop using OSX or something, then they run Vagrant, PHP inside Vagrant. So Vagrant is an abstraction layer for virtual machines. So underline is virtual box, but it can also it also has provider adap adapters for things like AWS machines and so on. Each VM is a system in its own right. So it has allocated resources, virtualized hardware and so on. However, Docker containers, they are one level higher. They all make use of the same underlying host kernel. So that means they run, actually run as regular processes on host machines, just that they are isolated from each other. So this also implies that Docker is Linux only currently. Uh, so running Docker on OSX and Windows requires a virtual machine. So most, uh, if you use boot to Docker, for example, then it uses a virtual box. And this is the graphic from the Docker website itself. So 
virtual machine, it has a hypervisor that everything sits on top. But for Docker, uh, basically you just it's just normal processors on the machine itself. So Docker on OS X and Windows, so that they have provided a boot to Docker application that you can use to run Docker. And it's just a wrapper around VirtualBox. So VirtualBox runs a virtual machine, tiny core Linux. So it Docker is installed inside. So how you use it is you actually use a Docker client on uh, your OS X uh, terminal. Then you can use it to communicate with the da daemon inside the virtual machine. However, if you are running something like Ubuntu on the production server, then basically the client just communicate directly with the daemon on the same same host. So if you want something that's more user friendly, there's a, also a Kitematic GUI, which is recently uh, recently acquired by Docker. Also uses VirtualBox underneath, but it has a more user friendly interface, so you can try this out instead. So now we come into some of the basic Docker concepts. So Docker has concept of images, <coughs> and images are index file system layers which combine into a snapshot of the get of the file system. So basically, you create layers of different uh, files. So every change you make to the file system is copy on write. So that means each each layer is kind of like a diff. So many images can share the same base. So basically, each uh, each layer they create create another image. So new images can reference this new layer, and then it, become, it becomes yet another image. So it's kind of like a tree structure. And what Docker does is provide uh, tools to manage and distribute these images. And they also have something called a Docker Hub, which is kind of like a GitHub but for Docker images, which is a central repository for uploading and downloading shared images. Now, this is another image from the Docker website itself. So you have the base, uh, basically the root FS, so the root file system, which most Linux distributions you can see. Then you start adding layers on top. Like for example, you run a command, you want you add a few files which is related to like say Emacs or you add Apache. So this causes changes to the file system which are saved as a layer. And containers are simply <coughs> runtime instances of images. So you can say uh, based on this image, I want to spawn a container of it. So it will create an additional read-write layer on top of that image. And when it starts, uh, it allocates and isolates resources using those uh, Linux tools that you saw before, C groups, namespaces, and all that. It isolates the file system and network and so on, and executes the process as the first process ID. And when you stop a container, it will still retain the file system changes that you made since it's a new layer on top of the image. <coughs> and if you want to save it as an image, then you can use a commit. Uh, and then the third one is, is this is not a first class citizen in Docker yet. Uh, basically, volumes. You mount external directory from the host machine to a Docker container. So you don't want to save it as part of the image, you want to keep it separate. So it can be either by mount when you create a container, then you mount a directory from the host into a container, or you can create a name volume. So the difference is just the volume is stored inside the, the Docker data directory rather than whatever directory you specify for. And if you name the, the container that you create, then you can actually uh, retrieve the volumes from that container and then, for example, attach it to a different container. So multiple containers can share the same data volumes. And volumes are local to the host machine that cannot be distributed like images. So this is one part still lacking in Docker. And some people have tried to solve it by using uh, projects like Flocker and so on. But yeah, there's no official solution yet, although they are working on it. So when you download and install Docker, what you're getting is just a Docker binary, which is a GoLang compile program. Uh, it's a da daemon and a client rolled into one. So the client, when you run commands using the client, it makes RPC calls to the daemon and which creates containers as child processors. So there are some other co uh, competing technologies, so to speak, like CoreOS that created something called Rocket, 
which is an alternative container specification. And they don't use the same concept that delegate this process to other to the init system like system D. And yeah, this is a bit visualization. First, to create image, you can create using a Docker file. And inside the Docker file is a bunch of commands which say or which base image to uh, create your new image form and what commands to run inside it to change the file system. And other that you can expose certain ports and then you can say uh, run this command when the container starts. So that will be your PID one. So you can build that image and then tag it, then you can push it to a registry. So kind of like GitHub. Then on a different host on a compu another computer, then you can say pull this image from that registry. Then you can run it as a container. And then any changes you make to the container, you want to save it back to the image, then use commit. So how are Docker files created? It's just a plain text file. And inside it is a series of commands. And each command will create a new image layer. So first command usually will be the from, where you specify a, from a certain base image like Ubuntu or Debian. So they, basically when you do this, then basically creates a base image, a base layer, which is just the entire Ubuntu or uh, file system. There's other things like maintainer, environment, set environment flags, then add and copy, which are quite similar in, in that uh, when you run the build process, it takes the current directory as a context. So you can add files from the current directory into the container, into the image. So let's say for example you have configuration files that you want to add to the image, then you put them in, inside the current directory, and then you can use the add command. Then inside the Inside the Docker file, then you can use a run command to say, okay, I want to install certain files, for example, then I do want to use app get in Ubuntu. Then you just run app get install and then it will change the file system. It will persist the changes of the file system back to the image. Then other, other than that, some of this, the, the rest is for when you run the container itself, then you want to expose certain ports. For example, you want to run a web server, you want to expose port 80 and 443, 443 then you declare them here as well. And then last two is uh, entry point and command. So these two work in conjunction. Entry point is basically the process that you want to run when you start the container. So the, the idea is that each container always runs a single process. So then that's, uh, although you can actually make it run multiple processes, but uh, the design was that it runs a single process as the first PID. So entry point will define this process. If you don't specify anything, then it's actually taken to be bin slash bin slash sh, so the, the uh, command shell. And then the command itself is appended to this entry point. So if you say, for example, you run a container and you say the command is uh, add get install, for example, then it's basically bin sh dash c add get install. So this is a sample Docker file that you create uh, based on Debian. Then you specify some environment variables that you run all this install installation, like you install curl, wget, and php npm. Then afterwards you clean all the temporary files. Then afterwards, once you run this, then basically you have an image which, which you can run as a container. And then inside that container, you already have curl, wget, and php npm. So there are some issues with this. So because each <coughs> command creates a new layer. So when you run this, basically all the file system changes are already there. When you run clean and then delete, it adds on to the file system. So that means all the temporary files are already persisted to your image. So all these commands don't actually do anything to reduce the size. So what people usually do is they combine this into one single command. And what this does is basically only when the app get update runs to the end where it deletes all the temporary files, then only then it gets persisted to the image. And since some of these installation scripts can get quite complicated, some people also just uh, put them into 
uh, shell scripts push that add to the image itself so at the final stage clean up will actually delete the build directory so you have access to the docker binary so when you run commands like docker build then so it goes through the docker file builds the image and then you can see in uh, docker P, uh, ps so a continuous spawn from this image will then terminate immediately so right now there are no commands you, don't, you haven't specified a single command here, so it's just being SH and then it just exits. You can pass in a command when you run a container. So this will override the default command inside the Docker file. So you can do something like echo, hide, and then it will terminate with that particular output. So you just say hide. So stop containers that will remain listed in Docker PS. So until you remove them by running Docker RM. You can also automatically clean up after running it by, by using this flag RM. Uh, just to demonstrate. So now here I have a few Docker files. So this is quite simple. Uh, so Alpine is just a small Linux distribution. It's kind of like BusyBox. So it is the mm. defining feature is that it's really, really small. So it only has the most basic utilities. And then it has a small package manager called APK. So you can add uh, Git, Pro, and so on. So what I do is Docker build dash T and then So dash t is to tag the image. So when you build something, you must specify a name. So this tag will be the name of the image that you build. Then you pipe it into, or it's using the cache. So once you build something, uh, build an image, all the layers are actually saved to the cache. So in order to, to not use the cache, then you just also specify no cache. So right now it's running the, the package manager. It's installing all the programs that it specified. So you're running this modern container button in the host OS now, right? In the host OS, yes. Right, okay. And it's creating the container now at this point. Yeah. So now it's done, then you can see in Docker images. Well, there's a bit much Docker images. So it's created a sgphp slash git, and it's a 65 megabyte container. So you can do Docker run sgphp git, and it does nothing, there's no command. So what you can do is add the command afterwards, so echo. Yep. So it actually runs this command within the container itself. So if you run something like mm, slash bin slash sh dash c Anyway, we'll continue first. I think it's in the other page. Yeah, this one. Why do you put the Docker to just run in the, 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 the script that I want in a daemon mode, and then you say a browser to access something running on it? OK. Uh, because how does the networking work? OK, that will, that will come now. Yeah. So what I do is uh, I'll demonstrate what it does when you run something that's continuous, <coughs> that doesn't terminate. Okay, so what it does is now you're running something that keeps looping. So it's kind of like a demonized process. So now you get something like this. And if you want to do this, you want to run this in the background, then you add a flag. It's called dash D, uh, daemon 
entertainment money entertainment mode oops something got Say again, SVPHP, get okay. Just okay. not running the demon mode. Yep. So if you say Docker PS, then you say then you see it's running. Yeah. Oh. So if you do something like Docker logs, and then just now I gave you a name, it's called high. So you can give a container a name. So now you can reference it. So you say Docker logs, then you see the output. And you can follow it by Docker logs dash F. Yep. So now that process is demonized and yeah, so it's running in the background. Then to stop it, then can they use Docker stop container name. And it takes a while because it's terminating the process gracefully. If you want to just kill it, then Docker queue and then same thing. Yep. So now it's stopped. You don't see it inside process list anymore, but you can see it in dash A. So just now it's terminated seven seconds ago. So you want to remove it, Docker RM. Uh, when you stop it, it stops running. Yeah. So you can start it back up again. Then you resume the process. So just now you create an image, you can inspect that image to show some, uh, show all the attributes like uh, SGPHP. So you put everything in JSON, then you can see, for example, what command you gave it, what commands you ran, and so on. Yeah. Can you actually SSH into that container and then run okay. whatever? Okay. That was my next question. Yep. So how to get into that container? Some people that say okay, install SSHD in the container, then you can use the SSH into it. But that's a better way. So if I run it again, yeah. and I use the command docker exec, mm -hmm. docker exec dash it, basically it's interactive mode and you attach a terminal. So and then hi, and then you run the command bin message. Then now you're inside the container, and I can say psaux, and you can see the process there. And this process pid one. But how? Um, so when you go docker exec dash it, yeah. how did it know uh, to go to when you that you specify as sp? Oh, it's the name high. I gave it a name just now. Oh, you gave it a name high. Yeah. Oh, okay. Name, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. So you can reference that container by the name they oh, give okay. it. Okay. Right. Yep. And the container by default has sharing from the base network. So you can do outgoing calls, you can connect to external APIs and get it in. You can connect outwards, you can connect out, but to connect in, you have to expose ports. So that's what we will see next. Oh yeah, there was one thing I haven't shown yet, which is Docker history. So this one just shows you all the layers that were used to create this container, and what size those layers are. So, for example, if your container is on, is of a huge size, then you can use this to debug what which particular layer created that size. Okay. So, inspect history, run in the, in the background, logs and exact. So, now you can go into additional things. Like, for example, when you install a RabbitMQ server, you want to expose certain ports. You want to be able to access, let's like, say, uh, the API. You want to access the management module. On the different ports, so these are two ports that you need to expose for RabbitMQ. 
then as you can see here, you also have modified the command so that it runs the RabbitMQ server binary. So this runs in the background by default, so you don't need to specify any additional flags. So it runs in the background, so the container will remain running. So you run dash D and then give you a name. And to find out which ports are exposed, then you use Docker port. Then you can see these two ports that you defined in the Docker file earlier. And now you can interact over TCP. So, so then would it mean that um, within my containers, I don't need to set up my own IP tables, firewall and all that. I could just use Docker then to control all the ports. Yes, Docker does it for you. Docker actually sets up a proxy. Uh, it does the IP tables forwarding and so on for you. Right, okay. So each container don't need to be set up individually then? Yeah. So you can specify whether it's a TCP, socket, or UDP, then it will change it accordingly. You can also map, for example, if you say expose this port like 5672, but in host you want to map it to a different port, you can do that also at runtime. So using the dash P which is published, then you can map each port mm -hmm. to a different port. Or if you want to map it to a random port, you can use uh, uppercase P. So it will map it to a random port in a high range, uh, 4915 to 665535. But the previous slide you had a command which had an IP address. Where did you get that? 192.168.59.1.0. Okay, this is boot to Docker specific. So because boot to Docker, it runs in a VM, right? So that VM has the IP address. But how do you get it? Oh, the uh, VM would be would be the one issuing IP addresses. Yeah, it's actually hard coded for boot to Docker. So boot to Docker IP, then it shows you this. So if you install boot to Docker, it will always use this IP. Yeah. Although inside the production, you are using Linux and you are running the daemon and the client on the same machine, then it will just be your local IP. So what happens if you have multiple containers that you want to have separate IP address? Then does your host, does it does, uh, I guess basically does Docker run as a DHP server also, where it can then issue out IP addresses? Mm. Or do you have to just kind of hard code somewhere that says uh, this container will have this IP address and that container will have a different one? Oh, you can bind to different IP addresses. You can what? You can bind to a different IP address. You can bind to a different Yeah, you, well, the, you can listen on a different IP address. Okay. That's, that's part of the publish uh, command. So. Oh, so uh, generally, it? each container uses the same IP address as the host, would it? Or it can be accessed, yeah, on the same IP address. So generally, it uses the same, yeah, and you access it through ports. Then. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, that that would be confusing because the same port could be exposed on the, the host and in the container. Then how will how do you run two web servers? Let's yeah. Say? Okay, so I'll, okay. I'll, I'll tell you why I'm thinking that because the idea would be that let's say there are three, four different components that run on different machines in yeah. my live architecture, right? So let's say there's a backend API at the front end web. So I would want to run one container that serves the backend API, one container that does the rest of the front end, yeah. mimicking what will happen in the live servers. And I want, want to be on one IP address, another to another IP address, and then they each connect to each other on port 80 or whatever and then do the stuff. Yeah. Because that mimics what will happen the, in the live system as well. But if they're all going to pick the native uh, host's IP, and they also, you know, uh, then it becomes very difficult to, to deconflict them. Right? Yeah, in that case, then, for example, if you are running two instances of the API on a single machine, then you can't bind them to the same port. So you use different ports, right? So container can bind to another port. Uh, internally, it's, it's still use it for AD. Okay. If well, it is exposed to say AD81. So the other machine will then have to be configured to talk to AD81, not to AD. Yes. Well, can, you not, yeah. can, can you not have, um, so each container have its own network um, interface? And then, and then when each container runs, it you know, let's say it was uh, using uh, DHCP to get its IP address, then it would just then uh, get its own IP address according to whatever the you know the your DHCP server is, is dishing out. Like, the, like can each container just have its own 
Yeah, ideally it would be best if Docker runs a small subnet and then keeps issuing right. IP addresses from that for each of the containers as they come along, right? That would be ideal. Right. That's so what like, VM does today, right? I mean, VM like essentially each container is its own virtual machine. Correct. Yeah, Docker doesn't do, it, do this itself, but there are other projects that will do this for you. Mm -hmm. Something like console, for example. Console. Yeah. What console does is actually assign different, uh, uh, what was it again, domains, mm -hmm. I think. So it is uh, based on DNS, basically. So it can reference a container by the DNS name. Mm -hmm. what, it does, what, it, what it gives you also is service discovery. So when you, register, when you run a container, it registers itself with console. Then basically each container has a DNS name. You don't use an IP address. Right. Yeah. So so there are multiple solutions for this. So there's but there's no official solution from Docker just yet. So then everybody makes use of those third party ones. Okay. So some tips and tricks when using uh, containers. So what you can do is distinguish between short-lived and long-running containers. So scripts versus daemons. You can use containers like simple binaries. Like for example, when you want to download, uh, you want to git pull a repository, you can actually create a container that has git, and then just run the container and give it pass it a command to clone it into one of your directories. So why would you want to use this? Well, there could be a use case, for example, if you want to store your git credentials within that container, then someone else can use that container and now that container has the credentials, he doesn't need to store it inside his host computer, his laptop, for example. And using this method, you can change several specialized containers to form your build system. So you can have one container that has git to clone a repository, another container with your build process. Like for example, using Composer or Gulf or NPM or whatever. Then once it's done, you then load your compiled application into the runtime container, which just has the components that are needed to run your application. So maybe just the PHP runtime. You don't need to install Composer there. And just now I mentioned loading the application into a container. How do you get files in and out of your Docker images? So if you are just have you, you just want a link between the host and the container, then you use a bind mount. So when you run an uh, image, you, you spawn a container, you can specify a mount using dash V volume, and you specify the directory to mount into the container. So directory mapping. Or you can pipe your files in. So using some Linux pipe, so you, you turn the files into tarball and then uh, untied inside container. If you want to do cross container, for example, you want to have multiple containers that share the same data volume, then you declare a name, uh, you declare a volume inside the container that's attached to the container. And the difference is that you don't declare the directory to mount from. So that volume will, be, will reside inside the Docker data folder. And that volume can be referenced through the container name. So that, that's where the concept of data containers come from. So a data container is a container that you create just to create the volume. And the name of that content, container is then used just to reference the volume rather than you don't need to do anything with the container itself. So to get files from the container to a host, you just use Docker copy. And from an image to a host, then you spawn a container from it, use a by mount to copy it out of the image. And when you are using Docker on production, then you want to use uh, you, you want to have logging and monitoring processes in place. And since you are already using Docker, you can use Docker for this as well. You can Dockerize your logging and monitoring monitoring processes. Docker provides APIs which gives you container events, container <coughs> standard output, and also all the resources that it's using. So there are containers mm -hmm. that will take advantage of this feature, and. Quite a few companies, quite a few open source projects that make use make use of this. For example, there's something like Logspout, which attaches the Docker API, grabs all their standard output, then can use it to pipe it to a syslog, uh, a syslog input. For example, paper trail or something like that. And so some companies like Datadog, 
scout and so on, they already have put out containers that you can run and then you'll gather all the resource stats. And I think some things that may not be obvious to people, uh, you don't have to dockerize everything. For example, if you have a database which is critical, then you don't have to put it inside a container. Usually, you put it on a dedicated machine. So if you have just one single process on your machine, you don't really need to run Docker. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily need an init system within your Docker container. Since Docker containers, uh, containers are used to run only one single process at a time. Some people circumvent this, they add an init system, like for example, uh, RUnit or Supervisor D, so they can run multiple process. This is okay, for example, if you are running a legacy application and you need something like cron or maybe you need a worker inside your, your application. But usually, you want to keep it like one single process per container. And you don't need to install dependencies and utilities that you are not going to need, for example, SSHD. Since you already have Docker exec, then you can make use of that. And you can explore using lean based images. You don't need Ubuntu to run your PHP, Node.js, or Golang app. You can make use of something like DZBox, Alpine, for example. You can keep your image small. So take advantage of lightweight containers. So basically, you can upload and download images really quickly and then bootstrap your system. Um, can I just back to your last yep. comment? Um, so your whole system, you would use something very small like Alpine. Yeah. But then would your container use Ubuntu or? Oh, okay. Uh, your whole system, you can use you can use Ubuntu, you can use anything that supports Docker. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just that inside your containers itself, since your containers are supposed to be distributed, so usually you want it to you, you want to upload it fast, you want to download it fast, so you mm -hmm. use something small. Mm, right. Okay. Although using boot to Docker has shown that you can also have a lean image, you have a lean system like Tiny Core Linux to run Docker. Right. So so there are actually entire operating systems that make that take advantage of this. For example, there's something called Rancher OS. So they actually run all those critical system components because they use Docker as an init system. Mm -hmm. So they run everything inside containers and then they have a user land Docker which runs your user applications. Right, but those type of dis like uh, are they running off of a base like a Debian or a Slack? Um, um, because sometimes you know they're not as quick to do the security updates and such, which is why you know some companies might be hesitant to use one of these lesser known uh, distributions. Yeah, so, so most people that will use something like Ubuntu or if you want something more secure than something like CentOS. Right. There's, yeah, there's something like, there's a few but, projects like Project Atomic, for example, which creates basic images based off Fedora and CentOS. And, right. Yeah, which just run Docker images. Right. Some issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was another entire presentation I made about uh, uh, lean images, lean containers, because when we started out, uh, we actually created uh, entire de build and deployment system. Um, we converted everything with Docker. Our deployment system was based on Docker. Our build system was also Docker, and so on. So just like the build the the tool chain that we mentioned. So the pipeline, build pipeline. So we use a third-party CI server, uh, which is uh, Circle CI. And when we dockerize things, it made it really slow. Because uh, Ubuntu, base image size is 166 megabytes. So once we started installing the environment, installing all the dependencies, it ballooned up to like 300 something megabytes. And normally this wouldn't be a problem because Docker is based on layers, right? So you just upload the difference in the layers each time you make an upgrade or make an update to your application. But I think it's the CI service, every time you run a test, it creates, it creates an environment. So that means the Docker daemon inside that environment has does not have any memory of your image. He has to download the entire image over again. So each time it's downloading 300 megabytes, it's very slow. So that's why I, I started doing, like uh, recreating the image using a small base image, using Alpine for example. 
So now the image itself is like third, uh, 50 megabytes, so much faster. Do you recommend to use in production? Because I use it in my own development on the Yeah. That's Well, Doctor. So, do you to use like a CI builder or like the system, or do you recommend to actually use in a like production work power? Because for the moment, you might post a long press. It might depend on your application, I guess. If you are talking about normal script scripting applications, like say Node.js application or PHP application. It should be quite stable because yeah, essentially, essentially you're just running a process on the system. It's, it's, the, it's the same thing. Yeah. So I get behind it because I want to like uh, be kind of low level because two is not running. If one goes down, you know, uh, without impacting the user uh, for another contact. Um, you can do this using Docker. So what Docker does is actually make this easier. Because, uh, for example, uh, you have an auto scaling cluster, and then if um, host goes bad, then you destroy it and create it. Or maybe when you're deploying, you actually destroy it blue green. You destroy the, the machines and then, or rather, you don't destroy it, rather, you create first and then switch it over. Yeah. But for Docker, you don't need to, you don't do it with the host, you don't do it with the machines, you do it with your containers. Yeah. So you spawn new containers with an updated application on the same host. You redirect the ports to that to those new containers. Yeah, then you destroy the old ones. Yeah. Since you're not dealing with uh, loading up new machines and so on, so the whole process is a lot faster. But that assumes that your host system is fast enough though, right? So fast enough for uh, so if he's talking about performance issue where he needs to spawn up another machine. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about, let's say, you, you want to do like um, EC2 instances, right? Yeah. Um, but in this case, you're saying you replicate a new container, but that container is still within that same machine, yeah. virtual machine, which is what's slow about it, right? Uh, uh, the idea to the client is uh, you can do a virtual network. For the client, it's one IP. But back then, uh, you might have a little bit of that, like, Let's say one machine, if a machine is not all full enough, mm -hmm. one machine can only handle 10 users. Right. So if we have a 100 users, the idea behind it is we can run 10 server. So right. no user know which server they are connected to. In this case, for example, one machine dies at this time, mm -hmm. uh, we can easily switch uh, the machine with uh, another machine container and without impacting to the user. Right. But in your case, what you're saying is just um, clone a container within that same machine. You you would do a pull first. You will upgrade your image. You upgrade that image. When you upgrade your image, your current container will still will still be using that the old image. So it will not affect your currently running containers. Then you spawn new containers based on the updated image. But isn't isn't your whole system already slow by that time? So if so, let's just say your whole system just contained one container, right? Oh, and, well, the, and that container is yeah. already slow. By cloning another container within that system, it's not gonna make it any faster. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is a different uh, use case. For right. example, when if your uh, system is overloaded, for example, then you, you will spawn a new host. Right. A new a new machine. Yeah. Correct. So if you spawn a new machine, then can you create a new container on that new machine relatively quickly or? Then you would download the image. Right. Yeah. So in that extract. case, would it really make sense? Because so if you're using Amazon EC2, yeah, then you would just create a an AMI image file. Sorry, my my use case is uh, not about performance. It's about like uh, you have a two machines, mm -hmm. like one machine die because most of the time you already have a, a machine with the preload. Right. So you're talking about redundancy then. Just to switch. Uh, right. Uh -huh. Why are we discussing stuff about this failing and things like that? Docker is not to be used on the system, right? It's, it's just that's my initial question. I think it is possible to use in production systems. Some people well, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Why? My understanding is that um, um, if you want to deploy the same, let's say, the same Docker container to multiple systems, whether it's for different clients or um, you know, that's when you would. Uh, you know, you, you make it, it's an easy, self-contained 
container that you just pass this whole image to a customer and they have Docker installed, then they can just take that container and not have to worry about all uh, the... Isn't that a performance hit at all to them? Sorry. Surely in production, it will be big enough. Well, completely able to leave this, right? It's, it's a lot less compared to, say, a virtual machine. Yeah, but nobody would use a, that kind of thing. Nobody uses virtual machine on live server. Is anybody? Sure they do. Yes. Yeah, All the time. No, no. When you're okay. on Amazon at, at or not. At the level, yes. But yeah. those, are, those are much more high performance tuned for that kind of shifting. Docker is optimized mm -hmm. for development, not for optimized no, performance. No, 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 no. Docker is not only for development. The main purpose of Docker is to have the process isolation. It comes with the additional benefit of deployment. Uh, it's not to say that you cannot use uh, on production. It does. Sources, it can you can it can help you uh, manage it nicely. So what what actually do make sense if you're talking about live machine, for example, uh, you don't if you don't want to deploy VMs to run like multiple VMs on the cloud to, to run whatever processes that you're doing. What you can do is you can have one, two, or three live metal machines, and you run all your processes in these three machines, and each one of them acts as redundancy redundancy against one another. So all your services are in these live machines. Let's say you have uh, um, various different application uh, layers. Uh, when one machine goes down, at least you have two other machines in place. Uh, what Docker does very nicely for you is process isolation. So you can have all these different applications running on the same machine, but they are completely isolated from one another. Does it help answer your question? <clears throat> yeah, but what I'm saying is if you go to a typical EC2 setup these days, yeah. there's already a performance hit that you are taking from hardware to your virtual machine. And then if you're going to add another layer of virtualization on top of it... It's not virtualization, it's, it's not a layer. Yeah. It's not a layer. <clears throat> if I mean, yeah, but, 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 but some, a Docker is still translating all your requests from the base port onto the other port, there is going to be some hit, right? I mean, has anybody you done a network hit? benchmark uh, uh, no, test to see? My understanding is Docker does not translate. Docker share, Docker use the same uh, kind of layout with the host. So whatever overhead you are talking about, uh, process overhead, it's the same, uh, it's whatever the VM overhead is already uh, in place. So it doesn't add additional uh, performance impact on that. No, but when you take an EC2 machine, for instance, there's already a virtualization done yeah. by the time you get the host, right? Yeah. Docker has to run on top of it, so there has to be some some consumption overhead on top of that, right? If I may add to that, sir, <coughs> actually, I, uh, I'm from the Philippines, just visiting uh, Singapore. Uh, actually, I've um, worked with Amazon, EC2. They're, they actually have a service Docker and uh, Beanstalk. So basically, yes, that's right. Uh, Docker will run on top of AWS. And um, to answer the question that you have raised, that uh, Amazon, that Docker should work on on top of Amazon. Yes, that is actually the very essence of, of the container of the Docker Dockerized content. <clears throat> so. Uh, there's an Amazon product right now that uh, it automates your, your Docker instances from your local. You push it to Amazon, just getting all the containers, not the kernel or anything, but that, but that the very container. Once, <clears throat> once you push that on Amazon, it, it becomes an instance that runs on AWS. So. I don't think Docker was originally created to solve any kind of performance issue. I think Docker was originally created to um, um, to make it easier for companies not to run multiple servers for different kind of applications that might have different, um, let's say, um, OS needs or OS requirements. So, so if you have like a, a legacy application that has to run on something like PHP 5.2. But you also have another application that you want to run, you know, a, a newer version of PHP, uh, let's say 5.6. You know, traditionally you have to have spin up two separate servers to do that, which then becomes, you know, 
the cost of two servers. But with Docker, you're able to run both of those containers inside the one server. Yeah, so that's, that, that's, so that's the that's nice of software like VMware and VirtualBox and so on, right? Right. But what I'm saying is VirtualBox doesn't compete with, say, Xenon. The, at the virtualization scale at which you would perhaps. This mm -hmm. is my point. But not, every, but not every service needs to be that high performing, right? Mm -hmm. Because the issue becomes more about managing the different types of, um, of uh, servers. So, you know, I, I, I assume then if you do have something that really requires uh, high performance, then you would get yourself an isolated box. To, to specifically run that, you know, that application. So the way, the but, way I see it is that instead of uh, putting all the services on the same virtual machine mm -hmm. and then taking a performance hit, I would rather separate them out into separate roles and scale each of them separately because but each then of you those need to, but then you need to spend the money to buy each individual server, right? No, you don't. You you auto scale each of those services independently on EC2. So you set up. The first machine with the first different. Right, but that's only if you want to use an EC2. Correct, uh, which is which is solution, which, right? Yeah, correct. But not so everyone wants to use an EC2. Correct. Solution. So if you are going on a colo with a, your own machine, then yes. Right. This might make sense. But for so example, to clarify, so this guy in offline, uh, yeah. because there is no virtualization layer involved with Docker. Docker is actually glue code. What it does is actually glue together all these uh, CH root, C groups, whatever, because it doesn't actually do virtualization. It does name spacing. So what processes you run through Docker, they are still actually running natively on the machine. Just that they are isolated from each other. So then if you have two containers, so let's say you had an application that requires a different kernel, let's say, then that's not possible then, is it? Yeah, because they all use the same underlying kernel. Right, okay. Right. Which is right. the point we're trying to make. So that as your rules become more complicated, this model of trying to take Docker and going live will break. It's still great for development, right? But as you go to the production and then you have operational issues. Mm -hmm. You'll try and want to find you each piece on its own because that's where your Yeah, there, there are limitations to this. Yeah, you can't use it for everything. Yeah. Anyway, this is a very interesting discussion. I would have asked you to go for a question and answer, but you know since you already jumped right into it, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, okay. I'm sure there's a lot more questions and I think uh, our subject of op operational Deployment and all that stuff is very huge and rich uh, a, a subject we can go into uh, in much depth. Uh, but we unfortunately tonight there's only uh, so much time, so we can let's take it offline. Yeah. I or you take it on to the Slack. Yeah. Create a new channel just for ops. I'm sure we have a Docker meetup. Yeah. I continue in the chat room. room. <laughs> there's Docker room. Anyway, um, okay. yeah. So that's all from uh, Chris. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, next up we have Paul who will be uh, sharing with us a little bit.